Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for having me today. Uh, my name is Ahmed Hosni, and I'm a machine learning research scientist at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and Harvard Medical School. I do have one uh, disclosure to make. And so to start off with a little bit of uh, history, uh, texture analysis is perhaps the precursor to radiomics, and we've seen a lot of work in that area uh, starting uh, back in the 60s. And more recently, just nine years ago, the term uh, radiomics was coined. And so radiomics is uh, almost a one decade old uh, scientific field, a sort of a new addition to the omics family. Um, at the same time, we've also witnessed the resurrection of AI research, uh, deep learning specifically. And for context, deep learning uh, mainly involves the use of uh, neural networks. These are structures that are loosely based on the human brain uh, in order to learn uh, representative features uh, from data automatically. And this has led to uh, many breakthroughs as we've seen and witnessed in the past few years. Uh, deep learning started making its way into medical imaging around uh, 2015, um, as well as into uh, radiomics research specifically. In this talk, we will first touch on uh, radiomics and its more traditional uh, methodologies. We will then move on to discuss deep learning applications in radiomics and how that has and is currently changing the field. Finally, we will identify some challenges ahead of uh, radiomics research in general. And so with that, let's get started. Uh, radiomics is the high throughput extraction of large amounts of features from uh, radiographic images. And so we've taken the image and data analysis techniques that have served us really well uh, in areas such as molecular imaging, uh, proteomics, genomics, etc., and apply these to radiographic images. This allowed standard of care radiographic images uh, to be used uh, in multiple ways, including um, patient stratification, be used to develop imaging biomarkers, uh, companion diagnostics, uh, and so on. And we clearly know that um, solid cancers are both spatially and temporally het heterogeneous. And this limits the use of uh, invasive biopsy based molecular assays uh, but obviously gives huge potential for uh, medical imaging, which has the ability uh, to capture uh, intratumoral uh, heterogeneity in a non-invasive way. Um, so a little bit about the state of the art in 2014 with regards to um, radiographic uh, tumor characterization. The radiomics process at the time involved uh, volumetric tumor segmentation, as you can see here on the far left followed by uh, feature extraction. Now these, these features are predefined or engineered or handcrafted features that describe uh, tumor intensity, uh, tumor shape, uh, texture, and so on. And finally, we have an analysis stage that looks at these radiomic features and associates them uh, with other uh, existing patient data, such as gene expression data, uh, tumor stage, uh, histology, and so on. And so on the, on the right here, we see an unsupervised clustering uh, of non-small cell lung cancer patients uh, together with their radiomic uh, feature expressions. And first, we, um, we see uh, clusters of patients that have similar radiomic expression uh, patterns. And we also found a significant association of these patterns uh, with primary tumor stage, overall stage, and histology. And beyond that uh, grew a need uh, to standardize what these features are actually measuring, uh, including their nomenclature, uh, as well as their uh, mathematical formulation. And so um, we continue to develop uh, computational libraries uh, that are able to standardize uh, feature uh, definition, as well as standardizing the um, computational imaging filters that are often applied uh, to these images prior to feature extraction. And so given an image uh, with a tumor segmentation, you're able to extract um, radiomic features in a repeatable and uh, reproducible way. And also related uh, are the many uh, systematic initiatives uh, that are working towards standardizing uh, image processing and feature computation steps of radiomics workflows. This specific initiative 
uh, used a combination of digital phantoms and CT images to obtain reference values and share them across uh, 25 inter-institutional research teams. And so generally speaking, the field has witnessed much maturity and growth over the past uh, nine years. And this gives you a general idea about the, the current state of uh, engineered uh, radiomics as it stands uh, today. And so moving on to uh, deep learning, uh, deep learning applications specifically in uh, radiomics, we'll find that um, the recent revival of uh, research, or AI research in neural networks has really been fueled by uh, three happenings. Uh, the first is the large amounts of data that have become uh, available to us in the past decade or so. We also realize that uh, GPUs or graphics cards that can run embarrassingly parallel uh, computational tasks in computer graphics are actually well suited to train uh, neural networks. And with more data and more processing, we can actually now uh, go deeper by adding more layers to neural networks. And uh, we also started introducing some fancier uh, methods to train these networks and avoid overfitting uh, and so on and so forth. And what this means uh, to AI research uh, in medicine generally is that we are slowly moving away from so-called expert systems that really had varying uh, degrees of clinical utility to more advanced methods that um, are in a very few instances starting to match uh, human uh, level uh, performance. And we've seen uh, many of these studies uh, in the past five years or so. And in terms of the effect that this had on radiomics, um, this means that uh, we are replacing um, the more traditional uh, radiomics approach with a deep learning approach. Uh, the, the, the traditional radiomics approach, as we've seen earlier, uh, that looks at uh, feature engineering, followed by a feature selection step, where we select the features that are most relevant to our problem. Uh, followed by a uh, classification step where you'd often use simple machine learning models um, to, um, to build the classifiers. We've replaced all of this with, um, with a deep learning approach that um, learns from experience, meaning that it is able to identify uh, relevant features uh, automatically. And so for a solid tumor, um, these features that describe shape, intensity, uh, texture, and so on, can now be learned uh, within uh, neural networks without the need for uh, predefinition. And in some cases, we've also seen that deep learning obviates the need for uh, full tumor uh, segmentations. And so to illustrate this, let's uh, look at a few examples. This is a uh, project uh, from our lab that explores uh, deep learning for quantifying uh, radiographic tumor characteristics and predicting two-year overall survival uh, of non-small cell lung cancer patients. We designed our analysis setup around uh, seven independent datasets uh, from five different institutions with separate discovery uh, and test phases. And we use a convolutional neural network to train uh, on patients treated with radiotherapy and fine-tune the same network for uh, patients treated with surgery. And the input uh, to the network were essentially CT scans that uh, were taken at the start of the respective treatments. And in both cases, uh, we uh, were able to show a significant uh, survival group uh, stratification for both high-risk and low-risk patients and uh, potentially proposing this as a means to augment the, um, the, the much coarser classification that is achieved uh, through uh, TNM staging. We were also able to benchmark against uh, models that uh, were built on uh, clinical features uh, as well as engineered features and the, the prior state of the art in radiomics as well as uh, the clinical gold standard that we have today, uh, including uh, tumor maximum diameter and volume. And we noticed comparable uh, performances uh, in the radiotherapy patient group, uh, especially when com comparing kind of the more advanced uh, deep learning uh, models to much, uh, much more simpler models based on, uh, based on volume. However, we found that um, there were significant improvements in the surgery uh, patient group. 
And it is important to note that uh, surgery patients are often excluded uh, from conventional radiomics experiments as there is a lack of rationale in, in predicting a tumor response uh, based on its phenotype if it is uh, resected. And because uh, deep learning models are, uh, are actually able to look beyond the tumor volume, uh, we think that, or at least the hypothesis, is that uh, tum the tumor surrounding tissue uh, has much uh, prognostic value in this case. And specifically for uh, surgery patients, uh, if we are able to stratify surgery patients into low and high risk groups, uh, then low risk group can be spared ad adjuvant therapy and uh, the high risk groups can be monitored uh, more closely. We also look at, at um, activation or saliency maps, and these are uh, trying to identify the pixels uh, in the image with the most contributions towards the uh, final predictions. And interestingly, we find that areas both within uh, and beyond the tumor uh, were deemed important by the network, especially the uh, tumor stroma uh, interfaces. And um, this, again, strengthens the hypothesis regarding uh, the importance of tumor surrounding uh, tissue, uh, a signal that has usually not been picked by uh, the engineered uh, prior state-of-the-art uh, approaches. Uh, this kind of um, interpretability uh, studies um, remains highly qualitative, and luckily uh, the, the area of deep learning model interpretability is, um, is an active area of, uh, of research. Uh, moving on to another uh, example, um, in this uh, longitudinal CT study of uh, lung cancer patients, we try to predict the treatment response uh, from these um, periodic follow-up scans that are done both uh, pre- uh, and post-treatment, in this case, uh, radiotherapy. And such a monitoring exercise uh, generally uses uh, recurrent neural networks. Uh, these are networks uh, that are designed to work with sequences like text, so they're able to retain uh, computations from previous inputs. And for that, um, we used uh, pre-trained uh, networks as feature extractors that are able to extract these most relevant automatically learned features uh, from the images and pass them on to the recurrent neural network uh, and finally uh, to fully connected layers where the prediction uh, is made. And our design also takes into account uh, the clinical reality uh, where some scans might not have been acquired uh, where actually patients uh, miss, miss following up. Um, we find that uh, performance is better with more uh, follow-ups as expected and we were able to extend the treatment response endpoint to other uh, prognostic endpoints such as uh, local regional recurrence and, and a distant metastasis. And we we're also able to uh, look at predictive uh, endpoints, including the uh, response to main and uh, adjuvant uh, therapy. And it's really important to note here that uh, all these inputs um, could be combined into um, you know, um, a patient risk score, um, patient risk factors, and that is really the, the holy grail of um, precision oncology as, as it stands today. So these previous uh, two examples we looked at were uh, more on the prognostic side. Um, so let's look at one final example in the therapeutic space. And the application here was to um, use deep learning uh, to individualize radiotherapy dose as well as predict the risk of failure of this uh, treatment modality. And so uh, in this setup, the authors actually propose a hybrid solution where they combine deep learning with a system that approximates traditional engineered radiomic features uh, during model training. And so they're essentially using uh, traditional radiomic features as the ground truth. And, and this was done really to bring some uh, transparency to the system. Uh, we've heard a lot about the uh, black box nature of deep learning models. And what this tr translates to uh, is that these uh, deep learning based features are often nameless uh, and obscure. And now you can compare and contrast this to uh, traditional radiomics where each feature has an explicit uh, mathematical formulation. Uh, however, there is um, you know, a counter argument uh, to, to this approach. Um, the argument questions whether it's time to move beyond the traditional methodologies that, that we know already incorporate human biases. 
uh, in terms of what features uh, we think might be predictive uh, for a given problem or not. Um, and we also have to acknowledge that it is difficult to attach uh, biological meaning to either a traditional feature, uh, a traditional radiomics feature, or, an, or more obscure deep learning features. Additionally, it makes us question really how um, interpretable uh, was traditional radiomics uh, in, in the first place. And um, are we focusing too much uh, on newer methods to explain concepts that have uh, always been uh, obscure uh, to us? Um, so this friction uh, exists and it will be uh, very interesting to see uh, where, this, uh, where this goes uh, moving uh, forward in the field. Moving on to uh, discussing some of the challenges. Um, radiomics uh, publications has seen a year-over-year -year, uh, increase. Uh, we think that we should be uh, cautiously optimistic about, uh, about the field generally. Um, there were roughly around uh, 1,500 uh, radiomics studies in 2020. And if we go purely on the quantity of research, uh, that puts radiomics uh, where genomics research was in the early uh, 2000s. So it is uh, clearly still in the early days uh, with a lot of challenges. Um, would like to highlight uh, three challenges uh, today that are specifically uh, related uh, to the data itself and uh, its derivatives uh, or the features. And perhaps the biggest challenge is the amount of data that is required by these uh, data hungry deep learning models. And we are looking at roughly uh, one or more orders of magnitude additional data that is required by deep learning models when compared to kind of more uh, traditional machine learning models uh, used in more traditional radiomics approaches. And indeed, we are amassing more and more radiographic images by the day. Uh, but much of this data requires very time consuming curation and uh, also associating it uh, with clinical data is, uh, is a really important factor here. Uh, we know that radiomics models often require outcome data and collecting such data is, um, is a very time consuming process with a patient follow-up that often lasts years. Uh, we also know it's very expensive to collect such data as it usually lives in uh, multiple silos uh, across uh, a given uh, institution. And from what we've seen, we've also um, found that the average cohort size in a radiomics study is roughly around 100 to 150 patients. It's a very small number compared to the number of radiomic features that are often analyzed, uh, usually in the hundreds or in the thousands. And so you end up uh, falling prey to the so-called uh, curse of uh, dimensionality uh, and likely to present a solution that is overfit uh, on, uh, on the data itself. Another major concern is uh, on the data acquisition side. And so this specific study used a phantom to measure the effect of image acquisition parameters on radiomic feature variability. And they did this across uh, four different scanner manufacturers in four different uh, treatment centers. Uh, they demonstrate that the variability in uh, radiomics features that were extracted from the CT images of the phantom was actually comparable in size to the variability observed in the same features extracted from uh, CT images of uh, lung cancer uh, tumors. And this uh, implies that the quality and repeatability of radiomics studies um, might heavily depend on the consistency of image acquisition and reconstruction uh, parameters, and in turn also depend on the, uh, the CT scanner itself, the hardware uh, itself. We also need more studies that build on previous work and helps reveal uh, vulnerabilities in these uh, radiomic signatures. In this particular study, uh, the authors took a previously published model and externally uh, validated it on in-house data. And they found that a similar performance was achieved using features extracted from the images with completely random uh, CT signal intensities. They found that many of these radiomic features were actually surrogates for tumor volume. Uh, that's a feature that we know is highly predictive of multiple endpoints in uh, oncology. 
Also, they found that intensity and texture uh, features uh, were not uh, pertinent uh, for uh, prognostication. And so when we start uh, introducing deep learning uh, into, into this kind of work, uh, the noise in the data is often exacerbated given the very high sensitivity uh, of the neural networks. And that is also an area that requires uh, much attention from us. Uh, biomarker development uh, in cancer uh, has mainly uh, focused on biospecimen-derived biomarkers, that is, those that are derived from uh, patient tissue, uh, biofluids, etc. And there has been recent recognition that imaging-based biomarkers are inherently uh, different and require different development pipelines and regulatory pathways. And so we are on the cusp of seeing some radiomic tools uh, becoming useful tools in clinical research, essentially starting uh, to enter the translational gap number one, as we see here. Running, for instance, a prognostic uh, radiomics model parallel to existing biomarkers such as TNM staging in a clinical trial can really uh, shed some light on its true clinical uh, utility. And the hope uh, is to see more uh, studies of such nature uh, in the near future. Thank you very much.